Our guest today is Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance Party of New Brunswick, and we're at the front end of the third week of a snap election in New Brunswick. It's August 31st already. Can you believe that? Hard to believe. So thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Dennis, for uh, having me. So lead us off. How uh, how goes your energy in, in the middle of all this? Like, time to run now. Go. Yeah. Well, you know, I was saying to uh, someone earlier, um, normally we have fixed election dates. So we have, um, you know, five, six months out, we're getting things together. You know, we're getting, uh, you know, sign design done. We're getting brochures kind of lined up, uh, candidates vetted all of that sort of thing and we literally had to compress all of that into really like a like a two week period i mean we knew when we were in discussions with um with the premier and the other party leaders i you know i sensed that this probably isn't going to end well um so at that point we knew we had to really ramp up but yeah uh two weeks we spent uh getting things together and now we're we're on the on the go on a daily basis one of the narratives that are is not covered through mainstream media, is the theme of um, taking some of the influence and power away from people who aren't elected mm -hmm. by making sure there's a minority government in the legislature, mm -hmm. because that's a consequence of it. Or maybe the snap election is created because those who aren't elected are getting frustrated with trying to have a four-way conversation mm. and just want to be in power and go back to the old model. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because... When the four parties were elected in the legislature, you really didn't have much time to get your wheels up and running and, and okay, this is how it works with right. the four-way thing. Um, and yet you were just starting to get your stride in a way as, as a, a unit of some sort. Mm -hmm. And you got us through the pandemic mm -hmm. which and still getting through it. So it's like, okay, how do we avoid going back to what's always been and start to embrace the new model of governance through more cooperative and collaborative approach? Well, I'll take you back to uh, 2018 after the last election. I remember myself, Rick and Michelle, walking into the legislature and not even knowing where to sit. I mean, it was just, it was a whole new experience. And of course, there's many procedures and traditions that go with the legislature and trying to figure all of that out. I remember sitting with the clerk and they've been exceptionally helpful, the, the clerk and, and all the staff at the legislature. But I remember him coming in and, and giving me this book about this thick and the cover said orientation for MLAs <laughs> and I thought okay here we go so you know c compressing all of that into my mind on what needs to be done and our staff going through a lot of it um, and I say that to say it was a, it was an incredible new experience uh, but a big challenge because we didn't have the structure the other two parties had the main parties I mean Mr. Kuhn did as well because he had been in there for a little bit so he had four years to, to kind of understand a little bit but we were, we were fresh out of the gate. So it took time to figure all of that out, the process, the traditions, when to stand, when to sit, um, you know, how bills are crafted and how we move forward with motions and all of that. So, you know, uh, with, with all of that, um, I'm very proud of our team because despite all those challenges, we were still able to, you know, keep government accountable and provide that stability because I... You know, I hear a lot today, I mean, Mr. Higgs is coming out and he's saying he needs a majority. And he's using the excuse of stable government. But what I would say, in turn, is that's not the case. Because really, the first two years, we had very stable government. It, it kind of come off the rails a little bit when one of Mr. Higgs's own caucus members defected. And, and he lost that stability within his own caucus. Um, and even after the negotiations that, that he had called for with Mr. Vickers, myself, and Mr. Kuhn, um, the Liberals walked out. He, Mr. Higgs is right on that. That, that is a reality. But uh, myself and Mr. Kuhn both said at that time, we will find a way to work together to avoid an election. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We put off, think about this, the COVID Cabinet Committee, which I sit on, we put off municipal elections because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And yet here we are now, and the Premier has called a general election, despite the pandemic. So we said, look, we, we can work through this. We'll, we'll find some common ground. Forget the Liberals if they don't want to you know, participate. It's okay. We still have the numbers between the three of us. Um, but he didn't want to do that. Yep. So it was clear the objective, and he's made it clear what his objective is, is to go back to the majority situation that we've seen for the last 100 years in this province. Yep. 
So how do we get the general public to have confidence that a four-way minority government or a, f a minority government with independent candidates in there, like, mm -hmm. how do we get the general public away from that old mindset that it only works if someone's in power? Right. And that there's actually governance. And you've been on the inside now for a couple of years, mm -hmm. sort of. Um, you didn't have a lot of time in the legislature. It was kind of busted up um, yeah. for the amount of time you're actually sitting there doing the work. But the committee work was pretty intense. It was. From what I hear. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and yet, here we are having an election during a pandemic because the backroom gang are the ones pushing for it. Right. It typifies the very dysfunction in New Brunswick politics in a way. It, it's, it's, a, it's a greed for power that surpasses a, a rational approach to government. And, and again, our position is that I, I understand the need for stability. People do not want to be going to the polls every two years. But what I would argue is if we return to a minority government, the message will clearly be sent, not just to Mr. Higgs, but to the Liberals as well, that this is a new path for New Brunswick. And it's up to the, to the two parties to then get in lockstep with the fact that we are now in a minority situation and you have to work together. You have to deal with the fact that it's a minority situation. There's no reason, again, that we should be in election now. I mean, we could have easily gone at least another year and, and possibly two right to the fixed election date. I think that's what New Brunswickers want. We've heard over, overwhelmingly from the vast majority of people that they like the makeup of the legislature. They like the fact that there's different voices in there and that no one party holds all the power. Um, to me, that's, a, that's an incredible concept that works exceptionally well because everybody's got a little bit of give and take that goes with that, and it makes for good government, period. Yeah. Do you think people remember Canada's federal minority governments when the most radical, radical, maybe the wrong word, but the most transformative period in Canadian politics was when we had minority governments? Sure. And, and it was really progressive, but it was stable. Mm -hmm. um, it was structured. It was a different dynamic, almost a European dynamic with yep. how all the pieces come in. Do you think they remember that to have confidence that two years later, after voting a four-way minority, that they go, no, we were barely getting the hang of this. Yeah. So let's go back to it. You know? No, and, and I, I can only tell you what I'm hearing. I mean, I've toured this province over the last several weeks and, and will continue to do so for the next two weeks. And what I'm hearing from people on the ground is, again, they, they like it. They, they like the minority situation. And I'm hard-pressed to find... Uh, too many New Brunswickers that are pushing to go back to majority governments. Unless you're a really hard-nosed PC or a very, very strong liberal that's, you know, caught up in your own traditions that, that you can't look outside, um, you know, the parameters of what you've always known. Um, vast majority of average Joe out there is saying that, look, minority governments are good. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and even if you look at the polls and it talks about approval rating, you know, I think that got to the PCs and thinking that, uh, you know, they have high approval ratings. But I think if you were to interpret those polls, I think a lot of people are saying we just like the way it's working. We like the fact that the legislature has some different ideas and different parties and different views. And, and I think some people can't articulate always exactly how they feel about something. Mm -hmm. But I think the high approval is high approval for the legislature as a whole. Mm -hmm. And thanks for wandering into that because... Um I'm really comfortable going into process questions. Mm -hmm. Most people want to talk about specific topics like election platform items. And stuff. Mm -hmm. But behind all of those things is we have to pay attention to the decision-making process. Right. And media often don't give it enough airtime. An example would be they called it the Higgs government the entire time through right. the pandemic. It's like, no, <laughs> right. no, that's a misrepresentation. It was a four-way group that worked together yes he gets to deliver the message right and almost all the credit well majority of credit goes to you all working together and then letting the pros um do what they do mm -hmm. because there was their responsibility to get us through that sort of in that spirit then um it's it's fascinating to watch um i'm going to focus on cbc as the example but um the other media do it too the rest of this transition has to deal with the larger narrative and how media, or general media, or mainstream mm -hmm. media are portraying all of this. Yep. Because they never really caught on to the shift that happened in 2018. Right. They still portrayed it in, in a two-party system and then these other guys yeah. over here, right? Yeah. And P, A, and B were always fourth, even though you were third. Mm -hmm. So that was fascinating to me. And to frustrating. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> to watch for two years. Say, no, they got more votes than the Green Party. Yes. And by with, your, with fewer candidates. And by your own standards in the media, you tend to allocate space yep. based on the votes, and you still didn't. It was like they can't change. Yep. Here we are in election period, and CBC, and in particular Poitras, um, the amount of space given to the language issue 
mm. when it's not sort of current. It's almost like he's trying to make it right. a topic. Right. So there was a story back in, um, oh, where am I, February of this year, and it was about the petition um, from that group, um, Mr. McBride and those guys, and wanted, mm. wanting to pressure you to get more stuff in the legislature on the bilingualism stuff. And Jacques gives it like almost a thousand words, or CBC overall. Incredible. Yeah, you couldn't get a thousand words on a right. story where you did something right. But right. This one we can bring at it. Um, now we're in the middle of an election, and Jacques had a story just a couple of days ago, August 27th, about an alliance candidate's French connection. Mm -hmm. and, and he's sort of walking a fence, but sort of not. Right. And always manages to sneak in core somehow, which is mm -hmm. from another history mm -hmm. and then associated with you guys. But when it comes to. You know, getting candidates in on time on the August 21st story, you got 50 words. Right. But the Liberals got 150, the Conservatives got 150 in right. a 500-word story. And, and that really influences general public understanding that the legitimacy of the four-way mm -hmm. conversation. So can you play in that space? And, I, you know, you can get angry at media if you want. <laughs> or, or you can leave it and say, we don't sort of care because we know we're going this way and this is what we hear on, on the streets. Right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, Dennis, the thing is, 30, <coughs> excuse me, 30 years ago, um, what mainstream media portrays, and if anybody thinks there's not a narrative there, I mean, come on. Of course there's a narrative. Right? They're selling a product like anybody else. Yep. But... 30 years ago, that that was significant. I mean, if you read it in the paper, it was gospel. If you watched it on the news, well, it had to be true, and, and that had to have been what, what the real issues were. But today, I mean, the only ones, you know, uh, that, that really uh, gravitate is, is has the old way of thinking, right? But now with uh, social media, with blogs, with these types of things that we're doing here today, there's, there's other avenues to get straightforward, direct information so that there's nobody painting a picture. Um, you know, I mean, the only editing I know that we've done, because we've done these videos before, is just uh, little pauses or something like that. But generally what we speak about, the people can see. There, there's, no, there's no taking this out or that. It's, it's, it's what you see what you get. Yep. Where when you do a media interview mainstream, you know, they're trying to compress it into 30 seconds. So they're taking out all this stuff and then they're they're forming their own opinion to what needs to be left yeah. to disclose to the public so that the public can see it. But again, I think the vast majority of people are very skeptical of mainstream media in general. Hmm. And they're more open to different items and different uh, uh, venues by which they get their information. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not good because yeah. there's a lot of disinformation <laughs> out there too. Yeah. So it's very challenging. I mean, we are in an information age like we've never seen in human history. Hmm. And, and it's challenging, uh, you know, to be able to get the right information and correct information and, and to try to sift out and filter some of the incorrect stuff and false information. So following that theme... Um your party is still being portrayed as a populist party. Mm. I can't believe how many times I've researched that word to mm. try to figure out what are they trying to do, but they definitely invokes a negative emotion. Right. And you're always on the defensive trying to deal with, in the second paragraph, of the People's Alliance, the populist party, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. And you're thinking, but does that apply? You know, is right. it authentic? So do you have a... You know, how would you push back on, on that? Well, I, I'm like you. I still don't know exactly how to define what populist even means. But but in, in, in mainstream ways, it's it's the narrative. Or, or I've seen articles, too, where you'll see, you know, the fledgling party or, you know, the new party. And I'm thinking, well, we've been here for 10 years. We've, you know, hmm. proven that we've, we can run in elections and have success. Yeah. And, and even in the last two years, I mean, what I've stressed is, um, you know, just look at the last two years. I mean, we haven't seen anything... Uh, um, uh, you know that's been detrimental to the to the future of the province. What we've seen is myself and and government and others. You know is, is rational, reasonable, balanced approaches to some of these issues. So, you know, I I think the narrative that's being painted by the mainstream. I, I don't think people buy into it nearly as much today as they used to. Hmm. And I think that's a good thing. The um, when you mentioned you know that we're the fledgling party, I flashed uh, Bonnie Raitt. 25 years ago as a performer. She had mm -hmm. won a Grammy Award for Best New Artist. And when she accepted it, she kind of giggled and said, yeah, I've only been at this 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Best New Artist. Right. You might be in that um, mm -hmm. spot. They, they'll they get used to you eventually. Right, you know? right. The uh, 
Okay, so, so let's wander into um, some specific election stuff, because thanks for going into the sort of the cracks about process or about narrative and crafting or framing images and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so what's what's the main drum you're beating this time? Is it specific on some policy issues or is it about um, getting out to vote? And, and do you think the voter turnout will increase this year because of the SNAP election or will the COVID stuff get in the way? Well, I think, uh, and I have to say, this would be my fourth election that I've run in provincially and I also ran uh, municipally. So five elections. And this is the strangest election I've ever run in. Hmm. Um, you know, there, there's no big rallies, there's no, um, you know, um, how would you say it, that, 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 uh, I mean, the excitement's still there. I, I still sense the excitement, but it's, it's very different. It's, it's not that personal kind of get together and, and, and lay out some uh, speeches and that sort of thing. So it's been a bit, very awkward, very different election for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of voter turnout, I am concerned that in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of an election that nobody wants, that we're going to see a low voter turnout. And, and that does concern me because every time we have a low voter turnout, it kind of chips away at our, at our democracy in a certain sense, right? Because so many people just get so frustrated yep. that they just stay home. School is going to be opening up here in another week, uh, getting kids back to school, getting everything back on schedule, and then having to worry about getting to the polls you know, on election day. So what I'm encouraging people to do is one good thing that Elections New Brunswick has done, and, and they've done many, but particularly is they're allowing people to vote right at the returning office, you know, to kind of, um, I guess, uh, minimize the, yeah. the, the rush. So I'm encouraging people, go to your local returning office, you know, vote any day. Anytime they're open, you can walk in and you can vote right there, and people have been doing that. Mm -hmm. So I hope that continues up to Election Day, um, but I do encourage people, go out and vote. I mean, it's it's critical uh, in so many ways, and especially if you're of the mindset that, that you like the minority governments because, again, the other parties are pushing for majorities, whether it's Vickers or Higgs, and, uh, and I'm confident that you know, a few seats in the middle can, can really play a, a massive impact on, on how we go forward as a province. Yep. Can we wander into the, uh, the bilingual issue a bit sure. and uh, the paramedic stuff um, and, and your vision for how we can tweak constitutional amendments and uh, a culture that doesn't need to be divided. Mm -hmm. it, I'm hesitating because my interview with uh, Jean-Marie Nadeau, mm -hmm. uh, four or five years ago, uh, past president of Société des Acadiens Nouveau-Brunswick, yep. you know, and Jean-Marie, like wonderful souls, written books, like, it's, mm -hmm. he's fun. And he said, Jean-Marie, like, what's up? Like, one, one degree of separation in this province. Right. Like, we're all connected somehow. Right. And yet, when you bring up the language thing, it, it's just... It's crazy. Yeah, po on a political level. Yeah, but that, but that's but that gets that feeling going in yep. the gut, and then that influences the voting, and 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 it's not that far apart. Right. And then you guys have come along, and because media wants to do what it does, and it brings up old things that were quite um, segregated in their approach. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you're just looking for the the common ground, common good, common sense right. thing, you know. And it's going to take people a while to catch that. Right. And here we are in an election. So, so, you know, if I said in 30 seconds, how come you're not anti-bilingual? How can you right. claim you're not anti-bilingual? Well, again, we've, we've <laughs> never, we've never, ever, ever said we want to get rid of bilingualism. Uh, as a matter of fact, you mentioned earlier a CBC article about, the, you know, the petitions to, to on a referendum bilingual. Well, this, this gentleman presented a petition to us, yep. said there was tens of thousands of signatures on it, and... I remember the day he came in, he had a, uh, a Rubbermaid kind of uh, yep. case. It had a bunch of papers in it. There was cobwebs and leaves. He grabbed it out of his shed, and so we looked at it, and it was calling for a referendum on bilingualism. I said, well, I, I don't know what this is about. So I had to research the go through every piece of paper. So I want to know exactly how many signatures are on, on these petitions. Yep. Turned out there was 2,453. Um, so that was hardly the thousands that he claimed. And uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to present this. This is not our party position. What we are simply saying is, is we can work within bilingualism, you know, to ensure that it works for everybody. And, and you mentioned the paramedics. They're a perfect example. We had para paramedics in this province that were either unilingual francophone or unilingual anglophone that could not get permanent full-time work. So they were constantly on this six-month contract. They couldn't get mortgages. They couldn't be stabilized. I mean, you can imagine working under those conditions year after year after year. 
And we simply said, this is unacceptable. And, and not only that, but it doesn't reflect the makeup of the province or the makeup of the regions. And mm-hmm. since we have been in there since 2008, we've made significant changes so that now unilingual paramedics can and are getting permanent full-time work. Mm-hmm. It increases their morale. It uh, helps them appreciate their job a little bit more. Um, and, and what it's done for average Joe on the ground, because people say, well, okay, great for paramedics, but what about me? It helps in response times in, in indirectly because if, if paramedics have a better feeling about their jobs and their position, they're more apt to go into work. They're less apt to call in sick. They're, they're, you know, all the dynamics that go with that. And, and you have more paramedics that are, are going into the field because now it's a little bit more balanced and fair. Mm. So things like that are what we're pushing for, not just for paramedics, but really across the civil service mm-hmm. to make it work. If you're a unilingual francophone working in Karakat, why should you be denied a position because you can't speak good English? But the same has to hold true for the unilingual civil servant mm-hmm. in St. Stephen. And, uh, you know, through a team approach and other methods, we can ensure that language rights are protected, but that it's done in a reasonable way. So when we listen to that, it, it makes sense. So why does, what is your take on why the Francophone community would push back? Because right away you can already hear the constitutional rights Mm-hmm. argument coming back mm-hmm. so in your view there's no violation of that constitutional right no it, but but here's the thing dennis it's like everything in life you have your extremes on both ends yes and 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 i think and this is why we have francophones running for us this election we've never had that before because mm-hmm. our message is becoming more clear and people are seeing it as more balanced but you do have you have these extreme francophones on one side right that everybody should be bilingual mm-hmm. great great in theory but never going to happen in practice and then you've got the other side which says bilingualism should be gone and eradicated right we we take none of those positions we're, we're in the middle saying look where most new brunswickers are saying look bilingualism here is here it's here to stay we support it but it needs to be done in a way that it works for everybody mm-hmm. and uh you know we're always going to have that pull on both sides mm-hmm. we've been we've been tried to be pulled you know to, to as i said the referendum on bilingualism get rid of it We've been pulled on the other side, don't touch language at all. Hmm. And we said, no, it needs to be touched. It does. You don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Let's just find yeah. ways to make it work so that everybody can uh, have a fighting chance here. This also becomes an example how a four-way government can wander into those spaces that a traditional two-party, they just stay away from that stuff because mm-hmm. it's dynamite for them. Yeah. But if you have a four-way conversation, then somebody has the courage to go, you know, it's 2020, we need to be looking at some basic systemic restructuring, Right. Um, still respecting everybody's rights, still respecting it. Because I keep wondering why it comes out as a fear-based story instead of a exciting Mm -hmm. it's a huge opportunity for us we can map out the next 40 or 50 years you know it it should be dynamic and creative and exciting yeah instead of oh goodness you're taking something away from me right and and you know just to reiterate too the official languages act comes up for review every 10 years Mm -hmm. so next year that review is going to happen here in the province and what i'm stressing to people is if you want to have a rational discussion around that Official Languages Act and see that amendments can be made that work for everybody, mm. you need a party in there that, that is willing to tackle that, that subject. Mm. And, and the other parties simply are not. And, and what I'm worried is if we are not at the table during this review, you're going to have a greater push towards a, 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 you know, like an expansion of it to the point where more unilinguals are left out in the cold. And that's what we don't want because we hear it over and over again. We see it in the job postings that are done. And... Um, you know, we, we just know that being at the table will help bring that balance back. Mm-hmm. Segwaying from that into education, and then after that, I want to get into some healthcare stuff, and then cut you to the floor to go mm-hmm. where you want to go. Um, I had a, I had the chance to interview a guest on a bilingual education system. Mm-hmm. Um, she was pretty convinced that she had a solution, but it would mean you know one education system for all students mm-hmm. and a different structure to the day in the curriculum, but. According to her research over in Europe and other countries, it had a 95% success rate in graduating bilingual students. Right. When I asked Francophones about that, they were worried about losing their culture because of it being bilingual. So for me, it got muddied at that point in time. Sure. So with this bilingual review and constitutional review and, uh, and the act, um, it will trickle into everyday life for some people sure. at some point. So do you have any early thoughts on how that might impact uh, an education system? Well... You know, I, I think there's some misconceptions out there that, um, you know, somehow we can 
turn francophone schools and and or merge the two school systems francophone and anglophone and and constitutionally that's that's not possible right mm -hmm. so you you are you're always going to have french schools and you're always going to have english schools that that's that's just the way it is yep. i have no wish with that i do have issues with school buses chasing each other around to get them there because education <laughs> starts in the schools not yeah. in the buses and, and we get our own education in the buses but not the kind that's <laughs> yeah. going to help you in life. and interrupt just a sec a lot of people should be walking to school when they can well then and, there's and another the, issue and that's too. another yeah. or using municipal buses where available sure. that kind of absolutely <laughs> but i mean in terms of education as a whole i mean it is a fact it's an indisputable fact that the french immersion program in the anglophone schools is another failure I mean, it just it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a 90% failure rate. And I asked, you know, other people in the legislature said, if any other program or government department had a 90% failure rate, mm -hmm. would you not try to change it? Would you not try to find different uh, avenues by which we can, you know, see success rather than at least 50% success, mm -hmm. better than a 90% failure? So, you know, um, I've talked to different people about immersion and... Uh, you know, having children graduate that are that are bilingual and have or at least a greater degree of bilingualism, and uh, yes, I, I agree. If there's ways that we can do it within the education system to make that work, and I don't think we do have to invent reinvent the wheel. Hmm. European countries do it, and they do it well. A uh, little different dynamics there with the fact that they are immersed in in different languages on a regular basis, but. I think there's still something we can learn there to adopt here at home. And again, that's specific to the Anglophone sector. sector. Mm -hmm. uh, the Francophone sector, um, you know, I, I think they just they, they carry on and, and do what they continue to do. And, and it seems to be working well for them. Yeah, they're doing well. The um, So tied to all of that, what I was thinking is uh, the Scrabble report was done in around 2004, 2005, trying to investigate why New Brunswick's education system <clears throat> wasn't getting where they claimed they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And as best I remember the results from her report, it was that there was too many changes in too short a period of time. That would have been during the McKenna era stuff, because every four years, every two years, there was a change in curriculum from foundation years to right. nobody fails to... And it's like our education system still stumbles because of that. So mm -hmm. those people delivering it, the teachers and administrators, still don't know what's coming down on top of them. Right. So it would be really nice to, uh, if a four-way minority government has a way of leveling that constant change mm -hmm. based on I'm in power instead of governance. That That is critical because the, um, the biggest frustration we heard from the MBTA was just that. I, I remember, and we heard that back in 2018. Hmm. Too many changes, too quick. Like, like just multiple changes year after year after year, and they hmm. just can't keep up with it. Just when they when they finally get a groove on a certain educational policy, yeah. the new government will come in and say, "Well, no, we're not doing that anymore. You're going to do this." So then it's just this constant back and forth. And um, I do think you you do need like a longer. Um, stretch of uh, educational plans and and again i think with the legislature that we had in the last two years we did as a whole continue on that same path right there was no um you know nobody was pushing for any uh, significant changes uh within education um you know it, it seemed to just continue on with where it had been and and that that's good in many ways because the mbta finds there's a little more in the school system finds there's more stability in that but at the same time, um, you know, you always got to be open to some different ideas. But stability is the key in education and, and to be able to know that this is the direction we're going on. Can we slide in uh, hospitals and healthcare delivery and such? Sure. Um, a little bit of backstory. I interviewed John McGarry about four or five years ago when he was CEO of um, Horizon Health. Mm -hmm. We talked about regional healthcare delivery models mm -hmm. and how New Brunswick's perfectly suited for regional healthcare delivery which when it's implemented sets up your recruitment and retention of professionals in the medical field, uh, your purchase of equipment, uh, centralized services. Mm -hmm. It means general public have to drive a little bit sometimes. Right. It also gets into the um, healthcare clinics as a replacement for the hospital in the community. Mm -hmm. So that was four or five years ago. At that time it was announced that St. Stephen Hospital had to close mm -hmm. and it would be replaced by something else. It wasn't like we're taking something away. A group rallies up around that says save our hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, then candidate Brian Gallant uh, shows up two or three weeks later, says, I'll save your hospital for you if you elect me. Mm -hmm. And then that all came to play. Right. Here we are four or five years later. It's almost the identical conversation. Mm -hmm. And from all the interviews and conversations and research I've had the opportunity to have, it's very clear New Brunswick needs to close eight to ten of its smaller hospitals. Mm -hmm. 
because then that facilitates recruitment and retention of medical staff that centralizes the expensive equipment and an improved service and, right. and it's replaced with other new modern healthcare delivery models. Mm -hmm. Can you wander into People's Alliance version of what we need to do on healthcare delivery? There, there does have to be some significant changes to healthcare. I don't think anybody's going to deny that. Um, I think COVID launched us forward in a very positive way with some reforms organically. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we've had seniors living in hospitals for, hmm. for way too long, decades, uh, you know, over, over the years, I yes. should say, that, that have been staying in hospitals that do not need to be there. Yep. And I remember pushing even before I was in the legislature, you know, we, we need to get these folks a dignified living in a, in a in a special care home or a nursing home not laying in a hospital bed in in the latter years of their life um, what covid did literally in a matter of two to three weeks governments have been trying to do for years and they they just bypassed all the regulations all the policies and they said seniors are unsafe in hospitals if there's a if there's an outbreak in a hospital, they're at, they're they're at risk. So we're taking them out, and we need to get them into into nursing homes and free up the hospitals. So when the COVID patients, you know, if the COVID patients come in and we get a surge, hmm. we have the beds available to look after them. Literally, it was incredible. Two to three weeks, mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. So we, did that happen because of cooperation in the legislature? Or did that happen at a committee level? That I don't even think any any. Um, or did the politicians get the out politicians of the way? The politicians just get out of the way. No, no. I, <laughs> I got to give credit just to the to the people in the, in health themselves that that just said, look, um, this is a state of emergency. Yeah. We can do things we wouldn't normally do outside of a state of emergency, and and to protect health and to protect the hospital system, hmm. we're just doing this. We're bypassing all this other stuff to get this done, and they did it. And then I can also talk about virtual care. Mm -hmm. We push for virtual care. I mean, this is 2020, and, and we said even several years ago, there should be more emphasis on virtual care. So patients can sit in the room if they get a sniffle, if they're not feeling well. You know, I mean, obviously, if you have a significant issue, you have to go to the hospital. But if it's just a, a minor ailment, you, you get on your iPad, you get on your laptop, your desktop, whatever. You get your doctor. He's looking at you. You're looking at him. You're having a conversation of your pain, whatever. It works great. The approval rating for virtual care is is extremely high, mm -hmm. which tells me how important it is. Well, that's another one that was implemented because of COVID. And, and that was a government decision, one mm -hmm. that we had pushed for and, and we applauded. Um, but, I mean, in terms of transform transformational change in healthcare, mm -hmm. I'll give you the example. I, I'm torn on this because on one hand, I give the example of uh, the health clinic in Minto. Mm -hmm. That at one time was a 24-7 emergency care hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember under Bernard Lord, uh, they changed that to a health community clinic. Yeah, and there were people bouncing on the top it of cars was, in front of Centennial It building. was crazy. You know, it, it was. It was people were upset. And I understand it. It's the fear yep. that you're losing something, right? Yep. Uh, but I can tell you today, that health center, and, and, and the CEO of Horizon even said, it is a crown jewel of the province in terms of community health center. It is a community place, not just a, a clinic. Yep. So uh, there's some very positive things that we can see out of that. What I'm concerned with is on the flip side that we don't lose services for these rural areas. And that's why when, when these six ERs were talking about closing, uh, the biggest issues I had were indeed with Sussex. I didn't want, I did not want to see Sussex, Sussex closed because of the demographic and the catchment area of that hospital. It, it has a, it a large enough population to, in my opinion, sustain it and to keep it open. And St. Stephen was the same because you've got over an hour driving to St. John for emergency care. So I understood those two in, in that dynamic. Hmm. Some of the other ones I, I wasn't sure of. I didn't really comment yes or no, but those ones I understood to be important. Um, so again, I think it's going to take, uh, it's going to take some outside the box thinking. I mean, people in urban areas have to have a certain understanding of people in rural areas too, right? I mean, there, there's a certain, uh, amount of service that everybody deserves in the province, whether you live in the country or the city. And uh, when you talk about closing hospitals, um, that, that definitely strikes a, a yeah. bad chord with people in rural areas. And part of the conversation with Mr. McGarry five years ago was that, that equation of hospital with health care. Mm -hmm. But things have changed so much. It isn't necessarily a straight line anymore that hospitals health care. Right. He also talked about, you know, tax bases and building community. and, and But community health centers and clinics mm -hmm. can do almost the same thing. 
But I, th I think too, Dennis, and I mean, something we've pushed on that I, I do want to mention, you know, it gets back to, you know, um, the duality in healthcare, you know, where we have Vitalite over here and they operate under their own system, mm -hmm. their own resources. And then we have Horizon over here, which does the exact same thing. Now, the problem is, if you look at patients that go through the Vitality network, it's exceptionally better than patients that go through the Horizon network. And, and what frustrates me is here as a province, we're, we're trying to float two systems. And, and, and they do. They compete for resources. Sure. Whether it's a, an MRI machine or whether it's a funding or whatever it is, there's this constant competition. And what I've always said is if we could take the two and make them into one system, Albeit, you may have some, you know, francophone administration for the, and, and people say, well, you're going to take the French hospitals away and turn them English. I said, no, that's not the plan. The plan is if, if it's a French hospital, it remains a French hospital. The difference is the administration of it mm. and the resources are pooled together so that it, whether you go into a Horizon hospital or Vitalte hospital under a new system, you're going to get the same level of service and the same level of care. Mm. That's uh, dancing on the knife's edge a little bit. But we need to go there. Mm -hmm. um, 750, 760,000 people forecasted to be maybe a million, you know, within 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, the systems built in the 60s don't sustain us today. Right. So we have to recognize the moment we're in that things are changing. Yep. Um, without that sense of fear rather than sense of excitement. Oh, we're in a rebuilding phase. This, right. this should be interesting. Because you could already hear the, the pushback that would come because that's the way it's always kind of gone. Um, and that could fit for education, healthcare, environment protection, any of those things. Um, about five minutes or so left. Um, where do you want to go? What What's your 30-second soundbite for election this year? Or, or what do you want to make sure people get out of People's Alliance um, this time around? Yeah, I, I think the, the message that I would give people that are watching is, you know, you, you have a choice really leading up to September 14th. Um, you can choose to go back to the way it's always been with majority governments, one party having all the say, all the power. Yeah, you have an opposition, but they're handcuffed. They can do nothing in majority situations. For the first time in 100 years, we have a legislature where a minority situation exists, where no one party has all the power. So you literally must sit at the table, figure out some common ground, give and take, and move forward or pull back and this is what I stress to people all the time you know uh, being in the legislature for two years there were many meetings that we had that the public did not see where we're debating bills where the government say look we're putting forward these four bills this is what we want to do and we'd be briefed on those four bills and there were times we would say that's not being passed <laughs> and that's not being passed so don't even bring it to the floor and they wouldn't they're not going to be embarrassed, right? Yep. So they're going to pull them bills back. And then the other two that are remaining they may say, well, that one's a good one. We like that. Carry that forward. This one's okay, but we need to make some amendments. And then you agree to the amendments, you push it forward, and you pass the bill on the floor. That's good government. That means nobody has all the say and all the power. And that's what we're pushing for. And I believe if New Brunswickers can see that for what it is, in, in, in the true spirit of cooperation between several parties, I think we can have good government for years to come. It's fascinating how the backroom gang would find that frustrating. Well, sure they do, because they're not used to it. <laughs> they're used to having majority governments where you, you get your, your executive council together, they decide the direction, and, you know, the hell with everybody else, they're going to push forward. And it doesn't matter if it's liberal or conservative, right? Mm. And uh, what we've said is, look, just look over the last two years. If you, if you agree that it's been good government, why change it? Keep it in a minority situation. And in order to keep it in a minority situation, that means you have to vote for anything but liberal or conservative. Here's a soft question about that's your tagline for your campaign this year, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's a strong message. We believe in it. We've seen yeah. it. And uh, I think it's an easy message for the for the people to rally around. Yeah. So people get it. It's common sense for the common good. And that's it. Chris just gave you an example of how that works in practice. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts? Look, I'm excited. Um, you know, any election campaign is exhausting, uh, <laughs> but it is exciting at the same time. And uh, I'm convinced that, that New Brunswickers are, are seeing this for what it is. Um, and and I, I do believe on Election Day uh, they're going to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.